أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد Inshallah ta'ala this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the seerah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Um, in our last class we were discussing the, uh, hid, the first hijra to al-habasha. We were discussing the first hijra to al-habasha. Uh, and we said that how many people participated in that hijra? Fourteen. There were fourteen. Right. Hashem was cheating off the board. <laughs> uh, can it, without looking at the board, does anybody remember anybody's name? from the participants in that first hijra? Uthman? Uthman? Huh? Uthman. Uthman? Well, that was what he just, he just mentioned. Uh, there's another. Who, who was in charge of the group? Who, who did the Prophet wasallam put in charge of the group? Huh? Uthman? Which, which Uthman? Ah, uh, no. It was, uh, was the other Uthman, Ibn Mad'oom. Uthman Ibn Mad'oom. He was the one that was placed in charge uh, of the group. Tayyip. Um, so in continuing uh, our discussion, uh, on the first hijra to uh, to Ethiopia or Abyssinia, um, we wanted I wanted to talk about Abu Bakr. If we notice, Abu Bakr's name uh, is not up there. Abu Bakr's name is not up there, even though Abu Bakr actually uh, he left uh, when the people were migrating to uh, Al Habasha. Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu uh, he left. To, uh, to go to Al-Habasha along with the group. However, we're going to read uh, the story of Abu Bakr's uh, situation and why he's not uh, listed uh, uh, among the people who migrated to Abyssinia. Uh, this is Sahih al-Bukhari. This is what we're going to be reading from Sahih al-Bukhari. Um, <coughs> under the, the book Kitab al-Kafala, uh, hadith number 2,297. Hadith number 2,297. Uh, uh, Al-Imam al-Bukhari, he says, Bab, jiwari Abi Bakr, fi ahdi Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The pledge of protection given to Abu Bakr during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, the reason why Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, is bringing this hadith uh, is going to show the permissibility of accepting someone's protection. And what that means is, for example, if someone says, I'm giving so-and-so a man, so-and-so has protection. So let's say, for example, we are Masjid al-Sunnah, uh, let's say, for the sake of argument, we're at war with, a di we're, let's say we're all one tribe, and we're at war with a different tribe, okay? And uh, Rida has, a, you know, has somebody he went to school with that knows him in a different tribe. <coughs> he says, listen, uh, Rida, we need, to go, uh, we need to go to the Publix to get some food, but I don't want any problems. Can you give us protection. So Ridha says, I give you my protection. Now what that does 
is it means that no one from amongst us is allowed to harm that individual. Why? Because one of us has given him, uh, given him protection. Now, uh, the hukum al-Islami or the hukum shar'i as it relates to this is that anyone from amongst the Muslims, when they give their word of protection, then that has to be oblig that has to be recognized uh, and is an obligation upon us to recognize that protection regardless as to who that person is. Uh, if that person was an elderly person, a young person, a free person, a, a slave, uh, a male or a female. So as long as someone from the Muslims has given their word that so-and-so is protected, then the rest of the ummah is obligated to recognize and honor that protection. Um, even if, <coughs> even if that, if that protection was given without the consent of the leadership of the Muslims, even if that can, that, that protection was given without the consent of the leadership of the Muslims, if someone from amongst the Muslims has given their protection, then it is an obligation upon the ummah to honor, uh, to honor that protection. Anyway, that's a whole different uh, discussion and there's evidences and proofs uh, to go along with all of that uh, but the point here is that now this is not in reference to the Muslims giving protection this is in reference to the Muslims receiving protection this is give, this is a reference to the Muslims receiving protection uh, and to add to this uh, the one who was giving the protection was not was not a Muslim the one who was giving uh, the protection in this instance and in this scenario was not a Muslim. And so this not only does it show the Muslim receiving protection, uh, but it shows the Muslim receiving protection and that protection being given by a non-Muslim. So uh, under this chapter, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, uh, he brings this chain of narration. He says, we were told by Yahya ibn Bukair, who said we were told by Al-Layth, who reports on the authority of Uqayl. Does anybody remember who Al-Layth is? Just, just out of curiosity. Anybody remember? Uh, uh, he says we were told by Al-Layth, who reports on the authority of Uqayl, who reports on the authority of Ibn Shihab. You remember Ibn Shihab? Imam Al-Zuhri, very good who said that we were informed by Urwa ibn Zubayr that Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said. What was the relationship between Urwa and Aisha? That was her nephew. And her just, just so happened that his father was who? Everybody notice? Who, who was his father? Huh? Zubair? Ibn Abi Bakr? Huh? Anybody see his name up here? Huh? Ibn? Oh, you can't see it? What's number two? Who's number two? Ibn al-Awwam, that, that was the father of, of Urwa. Urwa's father was Zubair ibn al-Awwam. And who was Urwa's mother? If, if Aisha was his aunt, then who was his mother? Um Salama? La. Who was Aisha's sister? Ah. We need to go through the families. Uh, Asma, Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr. So Aisha and Asma, they were sisters. Aisha and Asma, they were sisters. And Asma married a Zubair ibn Awam. And a Zubair uh, just so happened to be one of the people who participated in the first hijra to uh, to uh, Abyssinia. 
طيب. So Urwa, he reports from his aunt Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, since I reached the age when I could remember things, I have seen my parents worshiping according to the right faith of Islam. Right, so now we see that Aisha radiallahu anha is saying that I've never witnessed my parents uh, worshiping anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since I can remember, they were Muslims, meaning both my father and my mother. My father and my mother. She says, not a single day passed by except that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam visited us both in the morning and the evening. So that means the Prophet والسلام, every day would visit the house of Abu Bakr in the morning time. So at least twice a day, the Messenger والسلام, <coughs> was visiting with Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Uh, she says, when the Muslims were persecuted, Abu Bakr sent out for Ethiopia as an immigrant, uh, meaning Abu Bakr set out to migrate to uh, Abyssinia. <laughs> Uh, but again, remember, we said that, we, we, as you notice, his name is not here. His name, right, his, he set out when, they, when, the, when the Muslims set out to uh, Habasha. Abu Bakr was, 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 was there with them to set out, to go with them. Now remember, they didn't all go as one group. They couldn't have gone as one group because um, they, they, it, it would have been noticeable. So they each had to kind of, they slipped out kind of one by one, and then they met up. Then they became one, one group. And they went over, when they crossed the sea, they crossed the sea as a group. But leaving Mecca, they didn't, cross, they didn't leave out of Mecca, uh, you know, they didn't all meet up at Uthman's house and say, hey, y'all ready, you got your stuff? And you know, they didn't depart like, as a, as a jama'ah like that. They, they kind of left one by one, because if they would have gathered as a group, they would have been noticeable, and you know, Quraysh probably would have, would have stopped them. So anyway, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he set out. When he reached a place called Bark al uh, he met up with Ibn Daghinna. Ibn Daghinna was, his name was Al-Harith Ibn Yazid. Al-Harith Ibn Yazid. And al daghinna that was his mother. al daghinna was his mother. Uh, I don't know why he was attributed to uh, his mother, and sometimes that it happens that way. Uh, some people become known uh, by by their mothers; they, they become the son of so and so, uh, you know, and they're referred to the mother. That doesn't mean that they didn't have a father or they didn't know who their father was. It's just that sometimes people become ma'roof; uh, they become well known and well established, uh, and being attributed to that individual. Like for example. Um, Ahmed ibn Hanbal right Imam Ahmed he's known as Ahmed ibn Hanbal but who was his father anybody know his father no 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 this is his grandfather but who was his father his father's name was Muhammad so, but we know him as Ahmed ibn Hanbal right we know him as Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, it's just some people Right, Ibn Umm Maktoum, right? So some people, they just become known uh, by, by, by these uh, affiliations, uh, and Allah Ta'ala knows best <coughs> as to why uh, he was known uh, as Ibn Daghinna. But his name was Al-Hadith Ibn Yazid. His name was Al-Hadith Ibn Yazid. Uh, and is, is, there's no mention of him ever accepting Islam. There's no mention of him ever accepting Islam. I don't know. Uh, that he, if he accepted Islam, uh, but what is known is that as as far as he he was non-Muslim, he was non-Muslim at the time of this narration. If he accepted Islam later, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. Um, Al Muhim, uh, when he reached a place called Bark al Ghimad, he met up with a man by the name of Ibn Daghinna. Remember, we said his name is Al Harith Ibn Yazid who was the chief of the tribe of Al-Qarra. So he was the chieftain of the tribe, Al-Qarra. Uh, and we asked uh, Abu Bakr, where are you going? 
Where are you going? So Abu Bakr said, my people have turned me out of my country and I would like to, I would like to seek out the world and worship my Lord. I would like to go out and, and worship my Lord. Now you notice that Abu Bakr, he knew where he was going. Abu Bakr knew where he was going because remember the Prophet ﷺ was the one who instructed, <coughs> he was the one who instructed the Muslims to go to Al-Habasha. But when, he, when Ibn Dighinna asked him where he was going, he said, I'm going out in the world. Now, why do you think that he, he didn't say, I'm going to Habasha? Right, because remember we said he's not, Ibn Dighinna was not Muslim. And so if we would have told him, We're going, I'm going my way to Habasha, what would have stopped Ibn Dighinna from going to Quraysh and say, hey, you know, Abu Bakr, he's headed to Al-Habasha. So Abu Bakr, he didn't lie. He didn't lie. He said, I'm going out in the world. And I want to worship my Lord, which was absolutely the truth. Uh, however, you know, when a person uh, is in a situation like how they were, they were being persecuted. You know, we have to be, we have to be smart. And you have to be intelligent. You can't just be uh, naive. And so when we're dealing with these types of situations, uh, we can't just be naive and just hand out, you know, information freely. Uh, you know, giving up your position because that could put you uh, into, into danger. <coughs> and even if you yourself, like if Abu Bakr didn't mind being in that type of danger or being in pursuit, uh, people being in pursuit of him like that, but what about the others? What about the others that were with him? There were women uh, that were with the group. What about them? You know, that him speaking and saying, oh, I'm on my way to Habasha. That one sentence could have possibly put the whole group in danger. And so we see from this Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was very intelligent. Abu Bakr was very, very intelligent. Answering the question truthfully without, uh, without having to lie or give up sensitive uh, information. So uh, he said, my people have turned me out of my country and I would like to tour the world and worship my Lord. Ibn Dighinna, he said, a man like you will not go out, nor will he be turned out as you help the poor earn their living. <coughs> you keep good relation with your kith and kin. You help the disabled. You provide guests with food and shelter and help people during their troubles. What does that sound like? Does anybody remember? Does that sound like, does that sound familiar? That statement that Ibn Dighinna said about Abu Bakr. Does that sound familiar? That's what Khadija told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what it seems like, these, those people who are known as good doers, like in the community, it seems like this statement was something that was said about these people. That if you were known to the people as, as a good doer, if you were well known and well established, person in the community uh, that was good-hearted and, and helped others and things like that. This statement was a description that they, that they gave to you. <coughs> so he says, I am your protector. He said, I am your protector. So go back and worship your Lord at your home. Now Ibn Dighinna went along with Abu Bakr and took him to the chiefs of Quraysh. Now see, now this is the point of proof that Al-Bukhari is using to show that Abu Bakr accepted the protection of Ibn Dighinna because he was on his way to Abyssinia, on his way to Habasha, and Ibn Dighinna told him, no, 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 no. You're not the type of person that gets kicked out from where you live. So go back and I'm your protector. And Abu Bakr went back with him. Abu Bakr actually went back uh, with him. And they went to the chiefs of, the, of Quraysh and they said, they said to them, or uh, Ibn Dighinna said to them, a man like Abu Bakr will not go out, nor will he be turned out. Do you turn out a man who helps the poor earn their living, keeps good relations with kith and kin, helps the disabled, provides guests with food and shelter, and helps the people during their troubles? So now Ibn Dighinna is, is appealing to their reputation, right? Is 
the, rep, the Quraysh, they, in, in the Arabs in general, they, their reputation was something that they took as something that was important. They didn't want to be known as people who didn't have manners. Right? They didn't want to be known as people who were, 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 you know, they were rude and ignorant. No, they didn't want to be, they didn't want to be known as that. So Ibn Daghinda was saying, look, are you going to kick someone out who has these qualities? Uh, so, <coughs> so Quraysh allowed Ibn Daghinda's guarantee of protection. Right? So Quraysh, they accepted Ibn Daghinda's uh, protection of Abu Bakr. And told Abu Bakr that he was secure. I mean, you, you're secure. I mean, no one's going to, no one's going to bother you. Um, and so they said to Ibn Daghinna, advise Abu Bakr to worship his Lord in his house and to offer prayer and read what he liked and not to hurt us and not to do these things publicly. For we fear that our sons and women may follow him. We fear that our sons and our women may follow him. And so this, uh, it, shows, it shows that Quraysh, they recognize the power of, the da'wah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? That they feared so much that if he was to pray, like they didn't even say, don't call the people to Islam. They said, don't pray in public. Don't recite the Quran in public. Because if he does that, we fear that our women and our sons, they're going to follow that. They're going to follow that. Uh, this also shows us the importance of one protecting his family and being mindful of allowing things in society that will have an effect on a person's family in the future generations. Uh, you see that even the tribe of Quraysh, they were worried about their way of life. Obviously, their religion was kufr and shirk, but they knew that the Quran, if allowed to be made public, and freely propagated in public that it was going to have an effect on their children and in turn an effect on future generations and they were concerned about that and so likewise we should also be concerned about the things that we expose our wives and our, 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 our children to we should be uh, very keen uh, and in tune with what our wives and our children are indulging in because these things that they're exposed to can and they do have an effect uh, on their belief and on their religion. <coughs> uh, so they said, advise, uh, so for, for we fear that our sons and women may follow him. So Ibn Daghinna told Abu Bakr of all of that. So Abu Bakr continued worshiping his Lord in his house and did not offer salah or recite the Quran aloud except in his house. So now we see why Abu Bakr was not on the list of the people who, uh, who migrated to Al-Habasha because he set out, but he, he turned around. He set out and he, he turned around because he was given protection by uh, Al-Harith ibn Yazid or Ibn Daghinna, Ibn Daghinna. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she continues, she says, later on, so now the scenario is Abu Bakr, he returns back to Mecca. Ibn Daghinna, he addresses the chiefs of Quraysh. He says, look, this man is under my protection. So they say, okay. But he needs to pray and recite whatever he's going to recite, read whatever he's going to read, do whatever, you know, practice his religion in his house. <coughs> he has to do that in his house. So Abu Bakr agreed. Abu Bakr agreed. And he, he prayed and he recited the Quran aloud inside of his house. As far as publicly is concerned, that he didn't do that. He did not do that. So Aisha, she says, later on, Abu Bakr had an idea of building a masjid in the courtyard of his house. He fulfilled that idea and started offering salat and reciting Quran there publicly. So now he said, you know what? After, after praying in the house, he said, I'm going to build me a little masjid, in, like in my lawn or my yard, my front yard. I'm going to build me a little masjid. Um, obviously, it's not masjid like, like what we know masjid today with like 
fancy masjid like this, but it was something, uh, you know, something small and something uh, basil. And he started to pray and to recite Quran outside. And he did, so now, this, now he's making his salat and his recitation public. So she says, Aisha, she says, the women and the children of the, of the mushrikeen started gathering around him and looking at him in astonishment. Abu Bakr was a soft-hearted person and cannot help crying while reciting the Quran. So now, not only uh, is Abu Bakr reciting the Quran, he's reciting it with emotion. He's reciting it with emotion. Now remember, the language of the Quran, the, the, the tribe of Quraysh, they, they understood it very well. Like the language of the Quran was something, it was their everyday language. This is how they talked. It wasn't like how it is nowadays where the language of the people that's used amongst themselves in their everyday discussions is different than the language of the Quran. The language of the Quran was the language that they were using uh, you know, between themselves in everyday discussion. So they understood the Quran very well. On top of that, Abu Bakr now is reciting the Quran with his, recite, with his beautiful recitation. On top of that, he has the emotion behind it with the crying. So now you can see that this is a situation where people uh, can become affected. You know, because right now, if someone stood on the mimbar and started speaking with emotion and he started crying, like it's going to, it's going to have an effect on us, right? You're going to listen, you're going to pay attention. Kind of different, like if just someone stood on the mimbar where he was just kind of talking regular. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he started to recite um, publicly. And he, when he would recite, he would cry. Uh, so Aisha said, this horrified the chiefs of Quraysh. They sent for Ibn Daghinna. And when, and when Ibn Daghinna came, they said, we have given Abu Bakr protection on condition that he will worship his Lord and his house. But he has transgressed that condition and has built a masjid in the courtyard of his house and offered the salat and recited the Quran in public. We are afraid lest he mislead our women and our children. So go to him and tell him that if he wishes, he can worship his Lord and his house only. And if not, then tell him to, to, to give back your pledge of protection as we do not like to betray you uh, by revoking your pledge, nor can we tolerate Abu Bakr's declaration of Islam in public. And so you can see that, you know, that their position was they didn't even want, because Abu Bakr wasn't even propagating Islam to others. He wasn't challenging the people on their religion. He wasn't going up to them and saying, hey, you know, why are you worshiping Allah? What's your proof? You know, what's your proof of your worship of al izza What's your proof this, you know? He wasn't even debating or challenging them on, on their religion. He was just, he himself, practicing his own religion. But it just, it's just that he was practicing uh, his religion in a place where other people could see him. And Quraysh felt threatened. Quraysh, they felt threatened by Abu Bakr's open practice of the truth. And so sometimes uh, we have to understand that the falsehood feels threatened by the presence of the truth. You may feel like, I'm just, I'm just here doing my thing. I'm going to go and pray in the corner, go in the back, choose a quiet place in the back. I'm not going to bother nobody. I'm going to go in the back. I'm going to pray in the back. Uh, by myself, uh, not saying anything to anybody, just pray, make salat, and I'm quiet, Allahu Akbar. Uh, you know, maybe somebody might walk by, it's possible, but I'm not trying to uh, cause commotion, I'm not trying to uh, cause a, a scene or anything like that. Um, but the people of falsehood are going to feel threatened by that. They're going to feel threatened because the presence of, the presence of truth always threatens the existence of falsehood. Now, mind you, Quraysh didn't have a problem with the existence of the Jews 
the Christians, you know, different people who had different deities that they worshipped, right? Because not all the tribes worshipped the same deity, right? Quraysh had their, they had their, their aliha. But then the other tribes, they had different aliha, right? They had different gods that they worshipped. Quraysh didn't challenge them. They didn't kick them out. They didn't say you you can only worship those gods, you know, in your houses. Don't don't you know don't bring that here to public. They didn't say that because falsehood doesn't mind other aspects of falsehood being present, right? If you if the, those people who are on falsehood, they're okay with other falsehood, right? The fault people of falsehood they make agreements all the time and they are okay with one another all the time. They do that all the time. The moment that someone comes with aqidah of tawheed, it says, we are, I only worship Allah and Allah alone. That's all they have to say. right? They don't say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. They're not pointing fingers. They just say, oh, you know, I, I worship Allah and Allah alone. Now, all of the people of falsehood with their different groups and categories, now they have a problem with the person of tawheed. Why is it that they don't, they don't have a problem with one another, even though they're not all the same, they don't have the same beliefs, but they're okay with the existence of one another. It's just that when the people of truth come and start openly practicing, their, openly practicing the truth, now they have a problem with it, because the truth threatens the existence of falsehood altogether. Because truth and falsehood cannot exist in the same space at the same time. And the people of falsehood, they know that. And they know that the truth is going to outweigh the falsehood. And eventually the falsehood is going to go away. Because once people hear the truth, <coughs> those people who are sincere, people are sincere when they hear the Qur'an and the message of the Qur'an, right away they accept it. And this shows that deep down the people of Quraysh, they had, so they had knowledge that this that this was truthful. They had knowledge that this was truthful. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about Abu Talib, uh, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of these days, and the evidence that, and that showed that he believed his nephew. He believed his nephew. Now, he didn't believe in his nephew, but he believed his nephew. And the, and the difference is that he didn't leave the religion of Quraysh even though he did believe that his nephew was receiving revelation from Allah. He believed that. But he still stayed on that religion. So it shows that there were people in Quraysh that they knew that this was the truth, which is why they were afraid of it. They were afraid of this da'wah because they knew that it was the truth. But there were other reasons, <coughs> there were other reasons why uh, they rejected it. And I think we talked about some of the reasons, some of it is economic and uh, you know, social, political power, and things like that. And Muhim, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, she said, uh, we had given that the chiefs of Quraysh, they called Ibn Daghinna, um, and they said, tell, tell him to return your pledge of protection, as we do not like to betray you by revoking your pledge, nor can we tolerate Abu Bakr's declaration of Islam in public. So Ibn Daghinna, he came to Abu Bakr and he said, you know the conditions on which I gave you protection. So you should either abide by those conditions or revoke my protection as I do not like to hear the Arabs saying that Ibn Daghinna gave the pledge of protection to a person and his people did not respect it. And so Ibn Daghinna, he went to Abu Bakr and he's saying, look, either you abide by the conditions or I need you to revoke my protection that I gave you. I mean, I'm not going to tell you I take it back. I'm not going to say I take back my pledge because I don't want the people to say that Ibn Daghinna went back on his word. Right? He, again, uh, the Arabs, they were very big on reputation and because if he gave his pledge and then took it back, I mean, what, what good would his word mean the next time he gave pledge? Is someone in... You know, they, they hear that, oh, you gave Abu Bakr a pledge of protection, but then you took it back. So the next time, the next person, he says, I give you my protection. 
He's going to say, no, no, your, your word is no good because uh, you gave Abu Bakr a pledge of protection and then you, you, know, you rescinded that pledge of protection. Are you going to do the same thing to me? So he said to Abu Bakr, look, you either abide by those conditions, but I need, or if you don't want to abide by those conditions, then I need you to, to, to say that I, you know, that I revoke the protection of Ibn Daghinda. I mean, I give it up. So that it is not said that Ibn Daghinda went back on his word. Um, so Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, she goes on and she says, Abu Bakr said, I revoke your pledge of protection and I'm satisfied with Allah's protection. He said, I revoke your pledge of protection and I'm satisfied with Allah's protection. At that time, Allah's Messenger وسلم, was still in Mecca and he said to his companions, um, your place of migration has been shown to me. When, he's, when he said, your place of migration has been shown to me, meaning the entirety of the group, the entirety of the Muslims. Not, he's not referring to uh, Al-Habasha, he's referring to now uh, al Medina. He says, your place of migration has been shown to me. I've seen salty land planted with date palms and situated between two mountains, which are the two Harra. So when the Prophet Sallallahu told, uh, Wasallam told it, some of the companions migrated to al Medina. And some of those who had migrated to Abyssinia returned to al Medina. When Abu Bakr prepared for, for migration, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said to him, Wait, for I expect to be permitted to migrate. So Abu Bakr, when he wanted to leave to go to al Medina, the Prophet والسلام, told him to wait. You know, don't leave yet, because I'm expected to give, be given permission. So this shows that the Prophet وسلم, was given permission by Allah to leave Mecca and to head out to al Medina. Why is that important? Does anybody know a prophet that left uh, before giving permission? Yunus, right, Yunus alayhi salam. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, Allah ta'ala said, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ Be patient for the command of your Lord and don't be like the companion of the whale. Meaning don't, don't leave prematurely. So Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he didn't leave Mecca without being given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he knew that he was going to be given permission. So he told Abu Bakr to wait because I expect to be given permission to, uh, to, to go or to migrate as well. Uh, it doesn't mention how he knew. Maybe, maybe Jibreel told him that he's going to be given permission. It's possible. Allah Ta'ala knows best. However, he said, I expect to be given permission uh, to migrate. Abu, Bas Abu Bakr asked, uh, do you really expect that? Allah's Messenger Ali Salatu Wasalam he said yes. So Abu Bakr postponed his departure in order to accompany Allah's Messenger Ali Salatu Wasalam and he fed two camels which he had with him the leaves of uh, samur of samur trees for four months. So meaning he took care of he had two camels on ready. He was feeding him like he had these two camels and he was feeding them for four months waiting for the Prophet وسلم, to give him the word that it's time. <coughs> and so this shows the dedication of Abu Bakr uh, to the Messenger alayhi salatu um, And uh, this was the story of Abu Bakr and why uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, even though he set out to, uh, to go to al-Habasha, However, uh, he's not listed because he really, he only got so far and then he turned around uh, and he was given protection by Ibn Daghinna. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that uh, he was given this protection and he allowed this protection to, uh, to take place. He allowed Abu Bakr to remain in Mecca. Uh, because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he found out Abu Bakr was back, he could have easily said, you know, 
What's going on? Why are you here? No, 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 no. Don't accept this protection. You know, go back to go back to Habasha. Right? Because there was a solution. There's a solution for Abu Bakr to be safe in Al Habasha, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was his, his daughter went to Al Habasha. His daughter went to Al Habasha. So <coughs> the Prophet والسلام, was okay with this and he commanded the, the, the Sahaba to do this. Uh, and so this was a this was a viable option. So it wasn't like Abu Bakr didn't have an option. He had options. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he um, when he made Iqrar, when he agreed with this, this setup and this agreement between Abu Bakr and Ibn Daghinna, then this shows the permissibility of the Muslim accepting the protection uh, of the non-Muslim. It shows the permissibility of the Muslim accepting the protection of the non-Muslim. Now, Oh, we'll talk about that. Now, let's, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves, inshallah. Uh, we have to, I have to research the authenticity of that. No, no, I'm saying we're going to, inshallah, we have to, but we have to verify uh, the authenticity of, of those narrations, inshallah. Does anybody have, we have a few more minutes before the event, does anybody have any questions? This is the first group, right, because there, there was two migrations to Habasha. Well, that's, yeah, that's going to be the second, because Jafar wasn't, uh, he's not part of this group. We're going to talk about that, inshallah, ta'ala, because... Um, so next, next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about the Qissa al gharaniq which is, um, this is the story where uh, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he, he, was, he recited Surah Al-Najm in Mecca, and everybody prostrated, including the Kufar. And so the people in Habasha thought that the Kufar had accepted Islam, so they returned, they returned back to Mecca, only to find out that no, that wasn't the case. Kufar of, of Quraysh didn't accept Islam. And they eventually went back to Habasha the second time, which that included Jafar, included Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And it was, it's because it's, the second group was much larger. The second group was much larger than this. It wasn't Abu Sufyan. All right, Shaykh, we have to. <laughs> this, is, this is the second. Abu Anas is trying to, is trying to get us into. Uh, you, you're giving away too much of the story, Sheikh. Yeah, yeah, we have to be patient, inshallah. If we if we give all the answers now, you no know, no one's going to show up to class. Yeah, so we have to we have to keep people in suspense. You know. So inshallah, Taala, we're going to talk about the the laugh of that. Because I think we talked about that before, right? Didn't we talk about the the weakness of that? Of that, of those narrations, Qissa al The yeah, we talked about it one time. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think the, I think that the, the narration says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna al gharaniq la fi al darajat al ula wa inna shafaata hunna la tuhtaja," or something like that. I have to go back and and and, and verify, but I think that's yeah, yeah. Inna al gharaniq. Uh, in reference to the Aliyah, Gharaniq, in reference to the Aliyah, right? And so apparently they, they, that's why the Quraysh, when they, when they heard, the, the, when the Prophet Sallallahu recited the Surah, this is why they prostrated, because they heard uh, him praising uh, the, the Aliyah. And we're going to show, inshallah ta'ala, that this, this story is life. This story is life. Sheikh Al Albani, rahimahullah, he wrote a book uh, on the issue where he where he gathered all of the narrations uh, that are connected to this story, and he showed one by one how each of these narrations are daif uh, and they are not uh, authentic. They're not authentic. Um, 
So, inshallah, that uh, maybe we'll cover that next week, and then we'll talk about the second hijra to uh, to Habash, inshallah. Now, <coughs> any other questions? That's a good question. Um, maybe his persecution may not necessarily have been like the persecution of of um, of, of, of Ahmad ibn Yasser and Bilal and things like that. Um, because I don't, I also don't remember anything specific mentioning the persecution of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. I mean, maybe, again, maybe it's possible. You know, I'm sure people said things and made it uncomfortable. Uh, even though they may not have physically harmed him, I'm sure that they made it uncomfortable for him. Um, you know, when you're, when you're in your homeland, this is your family. Like, everybody is, we're all a tribe, we're all family. Uh, but, you know, people look at you, like, and give you the look, like, this guy. You know, it kind of makes you uncomfortable. Like if you walk on the scene and, you know, people are like, uh, let's get out of here. Like, it makes you uncomfortable. And so maybe this is what Abu Bakr was experiencing. Allah knows best. Allah Ta'ala knows best. I, I, but you're right. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember anything specific mentioning how Abu Bakr was uh, persecuted, uh, physically harmed, or, or anything like that. Um, so it's possible that maybe it's, it was a different type of persecution. Because uh, Abu Bakr had money. <coughs> Abu Bakr had wealth. Uh, so it wasn't, they, it, he wasn't easily uh, manhandled. You couldn't just walk up to Abu Bakr and just and do whatever to him because he was wealthy. Uh, and so, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So maybe that the persecution was that they made him uncomfortable to the point where he felt like I'm not welcomed in my own home. Allah Ta'ala knows best. And it's also possible that they may have done stuff to him. It's also possible that they, have done, they may have done stuff to him as well. But again, I don't, I don't know of any, any narrations in specific that mention that. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows best. But obviously, they were doing something. Something was happening to Abu Bakr for him to want to leave. Uh, you know, if he felt like, you know, I need to leave. Uh, so something was happening. Something was happening. Allah knows best. After he um, rejoined the procession, did he continue to pray outside or inside? No, he, he continued to pray outside. He continued to pray in public. Uh, he continued to pray in public. And um, the narration, as you see, doesn't mention, Aisha didn't mention you know, what were the repercussions. Uh, she didn't mention that. Because shortly after that, the, you know, Abu Bakr made hijrah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they really didn't. So it was about between the time that he gave up the protection, from the time that he gave up the protection, and the time that he made hijrah was about four months. So you see that Abu Bakr was under the protection of Ibn Daghinna <coughs> for quite some time. Because they didn't make hijrah um, until there was some years after that. Because right now, the, between the time of the first hijra to Habasha and the hijra to Medina, that was some years that went by. So Abu Bakr was under the protection of Ibn Daghinna for a long time. But he, he revoked the protection of Ibn Daghinna, and then about four months later, he migrated with the Prophet wasallam to al Medina. So even though the narration kind of summarizes things... Uh, you know, it gives a summary, but really it was a long time. Uh, there was a lot of time between, you know, the, the time that Abu Bakr returned with Ibn Daghinna and the time that he revoked uh, the protection of Ibn Daghinna. There was, it was some years that went by. No. It's time for the Adhan. I'll call the Adhan, inshallah. No samahat.
الحمد لله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله حي على الفلاح لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة وصلاة القائمة نأتي محمد أنا وصلى الله عليه وسلم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله Khair, inshallah. So uh, we'll stop here and we'll pick up next week, inshallah. Hada wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad.